Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 meetings. Once again, we thank um, Project ECHO Albuquerque, New Mexico, for allowing us to expand our license from our Bar with the Titus program. I'm Wendy Spearman, we've got Mark Sundra up here, and Nikki Wern is also here with us. She's going to be doing the primary lecture on COVID-19 and PIDI, and we'll hand over to <coughs> Graham Mankies, who's going to chair the meeting. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Wendy, uh, and welcome to everybody to this week's uh, ECHO webinar hosted by the UCT Department of Medicine. Uh, we're going to be following our, our usual format, which is uh, a brief update on the uh, epidemic in the Western Cape to start off with, then our main talk, followed by a panel discussion. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Hannah Hussey, who is a new face uh, on our webinars. Uh, Hannah is a registrar in public health uh, in UCT's School of Public Health and has been working at the data center of the Western Cape Department of Health uh, monitoring uh, the progression of the COVID-19 epidemic in the Western Cape. Uh, and Hannah's going to give the update today. Thanks. Thanks very much, Graham. Um, good, evening, good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm from the School of Public Health and I'm standing in for Andrew Gould today. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, the next slide, please. So, as you know, the testing criteria has recently changed um, and we're not going to be able to pick up as many tests as we were before. And this means we can't really use um, confirmed cases to give us an idea of where we are with the epidemic anymore. And we're going to become more and more dependent on hospital admissions and uh, death data to tell us where we are at. Um, next slide, please. So, with that in mind, um, can I I'm going to give, be giving you a brief introduction to the COVID death data that we have, looking at the demographics and the comorbidities of the deceased. Um, and then because today is a renal day, um, we're going to look specifically at renal disease and, and COVID. Um, before I go any further, um, I just want to let you know where we're getting our data from, um, because at the data center, we're putting together lots of different sources from both the public and private sector. Um, to, to put together all this information. So SPV has inferred episodes, which gives us the comorbidities for the public sector cases. Um, and then the NICD sends us death summaries uh, for all the COVID deaths daily. And then the contact tracing team was also manually capturing comorbidities, um, particularly at the beginning of the epidemic um, and, and less so um, now. Next slide, please. So, so as of this morning, we were sitting at 871 deaths. The majority of these deaths were occurring in public facilities, 72%. 16% um, were in private hospitals um, and 12% were occurring out of, out of hospital. Um, you can see the hospitals according to the number of deaths in the Western Cape here. Um, obviously, Tigerberg and Fresca had the highest numbers, but Mitchell's Plain did come in third. Overall inpatient mortality rate uh, was sitting at around 20%, but that did vary um, according to facility. Next slide, please. Um, if we look at the ages of the COVID deaths, um, we can see we've got a median age of 61 years, but this did vary with comorbidity. And so those with chronic kidney disease were a little bit older uh, with a median age of 66 years. Next slide, please. Um, now we're going to look at the distribution of the COVID deaths um, across the different sub-districts. You can see there's quite a lot of variation across the Cape Town metro. Um, the blue graph here is the number of COVID deaths per 100,000 population. And you can see there's quite high rates in Cliftontain and in Kailicha. Um, but this doesn't take into account the age structures of the different sub-districts. Um, and that's why we're looking at the age standardized mortality rates in red. And there you can see that um, Kailicha actually has the highest uh, mortality rate um, in, the, in the Western Cape. Um, next slide. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of a brief um, overview of the comorbidities in the COVID deaths. Um, so this is looking at um, public and private data for all the Western Cape deaths. And you can see there's a very high burden of non-communicable diseases. 
with 54% of all deaths having hypertension, 53% of all deaths having diabetes, um, and 15% um, of, of all deaths having chronic kidney disease. Um, important to note, um, patients often had multiple comorbidities and around 30% had three or more comorbidities when they died. Um, this graph does unfortunately underrepresent obesity and cardiovascular disease because the data from that depends on captured um, comorbidities more than the others. And so this is, a, it's, it's falsely um, lowered. The, in reality, the rates of obesity, cardiovascular disease in the deaths are, are, are much higher. Next slide, please. What we've done here is we've taken um, the top four comorbidities, um, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and HIV, um, and broken them down by sub-district. And you can see there's a lot of variation in the, um, the burden of these comorbidities by sub-district. And this goes also um, along with the age distribution to explain why there are differing uh, mortality rates across the different parts of, of Cape Town. Next slide. Um, so now we're going to focus on chronic kidney disease, um, which we've defined as a GFR below 60 for more than three months. Um, in this analysis, we restricted ourselves to public sector patients where we had the NHLS data to do it. Um, and you can see amongst the cases, around 2% of the cases had CKD. This went up to 4.3% when we looked at admissions. And when we looked at deaths, it went all the way up to 17.6%. Um, next slide. We did a similar exercise um, looking at acute kidney injuries. Uh, here we defined an acute kidney injury as um, someone who did not have CKD and then had a creatinine above 100 um, during their COVID admission. Um, you can see that 35% of all admissions had a raised creatinine and this went up to 56% uh, of all COVID deaths. So there is a high burden of both acute and chronic um, renal impairment amongst our COVID population. Um, this is some data that Marianne Davies presented last week, um, looking at the factors associated with COVID death. And I just wanted to bring it up again, just to highlight um, where chronic kidney disease fitted into, into all of this. Um, so you can see that at a population level, um, CKD was associated with a hazard ratio of 2.0, or increasing death. And then amongst the cases, the hazard ratio was 1.7, and amongst the hospitalized um, COVID cases, um, the hazard ratio was 1.64. So um, at various different stages, CKD remains an important risk factor for mortality um, amongst our population. Um, this is a similar um, analysis that we did looking again at the admissions. Um, what I, why I've repeated it here is just to highlight when we looked at um, all public sector admission, admissions for COVID, um, if they ever had a raised creatinine above 100, this included both the CKD and the AKI, um, you can see that they had a very high adjusted odds ratio of 2.81. So um, renal function does seem to be um, something that could be used for risk assessment. Um, and in determining the severity of, of the disease. It would have been nice to look at the creatinine on presentation and we will be doing that um, soon. Um, but just to say at, at a prelim, preliminary analysis, um, it does look like um, creatinine alone um, is an important risk factor for death amongst hospitalized um, cases. Next slide. Um, and then just to end off with, um, I just wanted to let you know that we've been picking up a range of sort of the more atypical presentations and complications of, of COVID. Um, these include the sort of cardiovascular um, problems of myocarditis, myocardial infarcts, um, but we're also seeing um, lots of pulmonary emboli. And then because we're obviously admitting a large number of sick diabetics, there's a very high number of uh, DKAs um, in our death cohort. Um, but this um, data is a bit patchy and not standardized and we still need to look into it a little bit further. So next slide. So just um, in conclusion, I just wanted to say that we have very um, different COVID uh, mortality rates across the, um, the metro, and these have been driven by differing age structures and differing comorbidity profiles. Um, we've seen a very high burden of renal disease um, amongst our COVID cases, both AKIs and CKD, um, and renal impairment during admission is um, possibly a, a predictor for mortality. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Hannah. That, that's really an intro, excellent introduction to our main talk uh, this afternoon. Can I just ask one question? And, and that is, um, the, uh, among those patients with CKD, uh, do you have a sense of what proportion were also diabetic? Um, I haven't. I haven't looked at it, but um, the, it, probably, it, it was it was sitting at around fifty fifty five percent. Um, okay. Off, offhand, yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, thanks very much. So we're going to move uh, move on to our main talk for this afternoon. Um, and as people are well aware that um, COVID nineteen is a disease that is obviously initially and primarily involves the lung, but uh, can uh, spread to becoming a multi-system disease. And one of the most common complications that we're seeing at Khrudeskia, uh, and uh, sort of reinforced by the, the data that Hannah has just presented, uh, is when, when, the, the renal, uh, when there's renal involvement. Um, and to address this issue today, is, uh, our speaker is Nikki Wern, a consultant nephrologist at Khrudeskia and at UCT. Um, Nikki is a um, is the head of the peritoneal dialysis service at Kudiskia's HIV re renal clinic uh, in the renal division, and she has clinical and research interests in both HIV-associated renal disease and and peritoneal dialysis. And Nikki is a, is a leading teacher within our department and within the health sciences faculty. Uh, she's the uh, fourth year overall convener plays an active role in teaching uh, both physicians in the Department of Medicine, as well as uh, uh, registrars undergoing subspecialist training in the Division of Nephrology. Uh, so Nikki's ideally placed uh, to give this lecture today on SARS-CoV-2 and its impact uh, on the kidney and uh, renal transplant recipients in our setting. So over to you, Nikki. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Nikki Wern, as mentioned. Um, I just want to thank the ECHO team, especially Wendy, Mark and Graham, for inviting me to come and talk about how SARS-CoV-2 is impacting on nephrology. I also want to thank um, Hannah for really giving a great introduction. And thanks, Hannah. It really has uh, led very well into my talk, which is I'm really grateful for that. Thanks. So, um, as, uh, as we are now all very aware, COVID-19 primarily manifests as an interstitial and alveolar pneumonia, but it can also affect multiple organs, including the kidney, heart, digestive tract, blood and nervous system. The actual earlier reports from China suggested quite a low incidence of acute kidney injury. However, emerging data from other countries um, that have been involved in the pandemic are describing a much higher frequency of renal abnormalities. So today I'm going to uh, start off with uh, discussing the proposed pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2 and how it affects the kidney. I will very briefly touch on the controversy regarding ACE inhibition and ARB therapy. I will review the current literature and discuss the prevalence, treatment options and outcomes of acute kidney injury I will discuss the outcomes of those who, are, who have chronic kidney disease as well as renal transplant recipients as they have particular, they're particularly vulnerable. And finally, I'm going to take a look at our data that we've collected from the unit to see how it's comparing to other countries. So I'm just going to first start off with the pathogenesis. So just to remind ourselves, angiotensin II is generated from angiotensinogen by the actions of renin and subsequently anchored to angiotensin converting enzyme in the cell membrane. I'm just going to get the, um, the yeah, angiotensin uh, angioconverting enzyme in the cell membrane. ACE2 receptors that you can see here are found in the lungs, the vessels, the heart, and the kidney. The tra this transmembrane enzyme, ACE2, removes the carboxyterminal amino acid of, of angiotensin II thereby inactivating angiotensin II and generating angiotensin I to seven. Membrane-bound ACE2 serves as the main SARS-CoV-2 receptor, allowing host cell entry and infection in the kidney. It is postulated to do so by binding ACE2 on podocytes and tubular epithelial cells. And this actually, just for interest, is also the mechanism of entry postulated by MERS-CoV. In addition to its full-length transmembrane form, ACE2 also exhibits in a, in a soluble form in the circulation. Okay. 
So as discussed, direct viral cytopathic injury is likely due to the expression of ACE2 receptors in the kidney. Numerous investigators has now, have now demonstrated viral particles using electron microscopy and identified virus in these tubular epithelial cells that you can see here as well, which is quite nicely shown in the podocyte. But I want to say that there is still a little bit of debate over this. And there are some authors that actually say that the virus actually, what they're seeing are these microvesicular bodies or catherine coated pits. But I must say on review of the literature in large, I actually am a believer that, that SARS-CoV-2 is actually in situ in the kidney. This was an important post-mortem post study of 26 uh, uh, post-mortems of the, one of the original um, uh, studies from China. And what they show is very um, how actually SARS-CoV-2 infects the kidney and causes acute tubular necrosis, uh, erythrocyte aggregates obstructing peritubular capillaries. And very importantly to me, there is seg seg segmental fibrin thrombi within capillary loops of glomeruli. This last feature is important as anticoagulation may very well assist in the treatment of these lesions. And in this post-mortem study, three out of 26 patients had these fibrin thrombi exhibited in their kidney. The pathogenesis of acute kidney injury is multifactorial and involves, as already mentioned, direct viral cytopathic effects, acute tubular necrosis from volume depletion, hypoxia, shock, or rhabdomyolysis, this cytokine storm, which interferes with endothelial function, which can then affect the kidney, myocardial dysfunction and hemodynamic instability, as well as hypo hypercoagulability, microemboli, and kidney infarction. I'm briefly just going to talk about the, um, sorry, the theories behind the ACE inhibitor and uh, ARB interactions uh, with, uh, with patients in, uh, in COVID-19. There have been harmful, um, there has been speculations that patients with COVID-19 receiving ACE inhibitors or ARBs may, may be at risk for adverse outcomes. I want to stress currently that there is no evidence to support an association of more severe infection with continuation of these medications or decreased severity of COVID-19 after stopping them. There are two theories behind the interaction with ACE inhibition and ARBs and SARS-CoV-2 infectivity. Theory one on the left are these harmful effects of RAS inhibition because as you can see here, the ACE2 is the receptor as mentioned for SARS-CoV-2 and RAS inhibitors may actually increase the levels of ACE2 receptors, thereby allowing the virus to gain entry. On the other hand, ACE2 has a protective effect of RAS inhibition, where actually ACE inhibitors or ARBs may influence or inhibit the inflammatory effects in the lung. And not to mention that the discontinuation of ACE and ARBs in some patients may exacerbate co comorbid co cardiovascular and renal disease and lead to increased mortality. Thus, ACE and ARBs should, should be continued, and this has been supported by multiple, multiple guidelines, except to say that, that, that they should be discontinued in the setting of acute kidney injury. So I'm now going to move on the prevalence, treatments, and outcomes of acute kidney injury. And I'm going to echo what Hannah's already actually started to allude to. Acute kidney injury has been, to, has been reported to occur in as high as 28% of patients in China and 46% of patients in New York. It frequently develops at later stages in critically ill patients. It is an independent risk factor for inpatient mortality. It is common in severe COVID cases, and I'm sure Ivan will agree with me, they're very challenging. There is a 60 to 90% mortality rate in the ICU and I'm going to show you now that one study from China reports 100% mortality once on renal replacement therapy. Multiple urinary abnormalities have been reported, including albuminuria, proteinuria, and hematuria, and as Hannah already alluded to, pre-existing renal disease is an independent risk factor for mortality. So I've done a nice review of the literature here, 
and I just actually with with my um, with my colleagues actually who gave me some assistance. But I just want to point out some important points. These studies that I've discussed are actually represent that they represent the main regions that have experienced the pandemic, and the only one that hasn't really been represented is the UK. As one can see in China, in the initial studies, acute kidney injury appeared to be quite low, and in the later studies in New York, it was much higher at 46%, with 68% in the ICU. Renal replacement therapy was quite bearable, um, and up to 20% in the New York study. And to mention that in Spain, they were not um, that that they have been some problems with offering renal replacement therapy to patients, and some of the information it wasn't available. And finally, I think it's very important to mention that mortality as high as 62% in the large New York study, and really acute kidney injury really is a poor prognostic indicator for COVID-19. Just some interesting points. Um, the graph on the left demonstrates the number of patients with an initial diagnosis of acute kidney injury by hospital day. And I just want to point out that there are two peaks. There appears to be a peak at about day one, and then there's another peak on day eight. So just because the acute kidney use isn't there initially, it may actually come a little bit later. And, and perhaps the initial peak might be multifactorial but a lot of these patients are coming in with fever and they're actually dehydrated at that point in time. The second graph, and this is from um, the study from New York, demonstrates that acute kidney injury occurs early and in temporal association with respiratory failure and poor prognosis. And from the same study, it also demonstrates that acute kidney, the worse the acute kidney injury in stage the worst is the outcome for the patient, which I guess is not that unexpected. So the aims of treatment for COVID-19 are pretty much the same as most cases of, uh, of acute kidney injury. However, there are a few caveats. We need to avoid nephrotoxins. There must be regular monitoring of renal function and urine output. Consider hemodynamic monitoring. Avoiding high peak, which might be very difficult in this setting, um, as it decreases venous return affecting cardiac, cardiac output and hemodynamics. Fluid management can be tricky. Initially, patients might be hypovolemic due to fever and decreased intake, and one must adjust fluid balance according to fluid responsiveness and tolerance and aim for euvolemia. Now, there are some novel treatments that have been described. There is no evidence to suggest uh, some of these, but I think they're interesting to discuss. Cytokine removal strategies like the cytosorb, and that's an extracorporeal circuit that you can see here, have been suggested to remove the cytokines for the cytokine storm. However, to date, there has been no evidence, and in fact, really, there is no substantial evidence for this, this strategy even prior to COVID-19. Continuous renal replacement therapy is the dialysis method of choice in hemodynamic unstable patients. Um, uh, some suggest that the right internal jugular is the preferred site for the catheter because it's visible and accessible even on proning. High volume hemophil hemodial filtration is recommended. And I just want to mention about plasma exchange and plasmapheresis as there is there may be a role in removing inflammatory cytokines, stabilization of endothelial membranes, and reset of the hypercoagulable state. And this modality shows uh, preliminary promise, but actually more thorough trials are required. Now, full anticoagulation is really very important when treating these patients on renal replacement therapy. We often see the clotting of the machines, um, regularly in fact, uh, citrate is the preferred anticoagulation modality, but we don't have that available to us at Fritiskia. But really the important point is that we really need to fully anticoagulate these very sick patients in the ICU. So what about acute PD? I just wanted to mention this because I was involved in a webinar, a webinar not that long ago in the, from um, people in the UK because they ran out of uh, dialysis machines to treat all their patients. And I just wanted to mention that it is readily available, cost effective. It can clear toxins in hypercatabolic patients. It doesn't really, it's not really affected by clotting 
and there's minimal need for external nursing input. However, there's not many of us who know how to put in PD 10 cough catheters and the increased abdominal pressure might affect ventilation. You can't have, actually have much control over dialing in the ultrafiltration volume that you want and there's always risk of 10 cough catheter malfunction. So I managed to find only one systematic review and meta-analysis um, exploring survival outcomes of COVID-19 subjects who develop severe acute kidney injury, defined as those receiving renal replacement therapy or stage three acute kidney injury. Um, only six studies were identified from the very last large search. The results demonstrated a significantly higher mortality in patients with acute kidney injury with a relative risk of 4.19, and they conclude that it is an ominous clinical predictor of mortality. So the way I look at it is that further studies are needed to understand these factors that are associated with worse outcomes, and understanding these factors may assist us in making more informed dialysis eligibility decisions under conditions where our resources are limited, as, as well as having very full intensive care units. So I'm going to move on to what happens when a patient who has chronic kidney disease develop, develops SARS-CoV-2 or, or COVID-19. Um, this is a particularly challenging group of patients. There are increased risk of transmission to staff, to patients, to family members, and many of my colleagues know how we've really struggled with managing our HD patients who have to travel to the unit three times a week. There does appear to be variations in clinical symptoms and outcomes for this group. Some studies have reported a very high risk of ARDS and death, and factors associated with death really are the same as those that are associated with most death in the ICU. In one Italian study, combining 130 patients, including transplant patients, they, st they stated that the odds ratio for death in renal replacement group was 3.8 versus the other populations, the general population. Just want to mention that China had better outcomes for their CKD patients, but their cohort had less obesity and diabetes. So I have reviewed the studies, um, the important studies here, and I just want to mention a couple of things. And you can see that we've started to put in the South African data, which we're, um, sorry, I'm just going to get this here, Mark. Uh, I'm trying to find my, um, no, can't find it. Okay, that's fine. You can see on the right that the South African data we've started to put in, but as you can see, the age of our cohort is a lot younger, that we have a lot less diabetes, and that's um, because of our strict uh, criteria of getting onto chronic renal replacement therapy. I also wanted to mention that Spain didn't accept their chronic patients onto ICU, um, and at, at the moment we actually are doing the same at Fritiskia. Um, and yeah, so they, uh, they're they quite a, a tricky group to, to consider uh, and manage. I'm going to look at the transplant outcomes that we've got uh, to date. Uh, the transplant recipients with COVID-19 appear to have more severe outcomes. They have a very high rate of infection. I think that's the really important key here. Uh, and the highest rate has occurred in renal transplant recipients with the lowest in heart recipients. And this infection rate was up to 50% increase compared to other patients, to other, other infected patients in Spain. So really, these patients really must be trying to self-isolate wherever possible. Um, in, and the mortality is also higher in this group of patients. So I've also reviewed the literature for this group. I'll just want to, um, not only is the infectivity rate very uh, high, but the degree of acute kidney injury over the board for all the studies was very high in kidney transplant recipients, as well as a high mortality. And we're still getting um, our, our data. We've only had seven um, at the moment. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to show you our Fritoskia data uh, following, uh, actually following this, uh, the next couple of slides. So um, this English data on mortality from GP electronic NHS records tells an important story. It demonstrates that death was associated with age, obesity, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, 
but also a previous transplant puts one at a very high risk. And I think that tells a very important story for us who deal with transplantation. So the management of kidney transplants is actually a talk in its own right, but I'd like to say that it's quite challenging and should take into, into account the age of the patient, the severity of COVID-19 infection, the associated comorbidities, and actually the time post-transplant. And it is very important to realise that the time of transplantation, one needs to use very high immunosuppression and we do know that those patients around the time of transplant have done particularly bad, uh, had a particularly high mortality. Um, subsequently and consequently, we currently have ceased our transplant program during the course of the pandemic and we're regularly reviewing it as to when we would be able to restart it. So um, at Fritiskia, we're dealing with a particularly vulnerable population. Um, many of our dialysis patients have travelled together, so we've had clusters of patients who, who have required transmission. Food given during dialysis is really important for some patients. Um, it was, uh, you know, it's one of them often one of the main meals that they're actually receiving weekly. Um, we're currently giving it to them in packages to take home because we really want masks on for all our patients. Many of our patients, have I've begun to realise, cannot self-isolate. Um, as I've mentioned, masks must be worn and we've managed to get a charity to donate all masks for our patients. But on the upside, we have a relatively young dialysis population. We've identified problems over the course of the last couple of weeks, crossing over of patients and staff through the different parts of the unit. Cleaning at times has been a challenge. We've had a lot of anxiety among staff and patients. Our early shift that starts at six we initially missed proper screening, so we had to put that in place. We've had staff members in our unit that have infected um, SARS-CoV-2, and really um, I've been very thankful and grateful to C12, to Mark Mendelssohn and his team, who have allowed us to admit our patients to that ward to enable us to dialyse them, because the risk of moving them in and out to the dialysis unit has been very tricky. So um, we've had a, they're very time consuming at managing all of these issues. We now also have two core rosters to redistribute our workload, one for our COVID team and one for our non-COVID team. So what does our fruit gear data, data look like in my last couple of slides? Um, Hannah's already mentioned a lot of this already, but at the moment at fruit gear, we've had 408 total patients admitted. 25 of those patients have been dialysed. We've had 78 deaths in total. And I just want to look at our renal cases a little bit closer, and I want to focus on a few subgroups. So I want to focus on our ICU referrals. We've been referred 16. Um, we've dialysed 12. There were a couple that we didn't feel was uh, that the prognosis was too poor to start dialysis, and actually one luckily didn't require dialysis in the end. Out of the 16 referrals, there have been 11 deaths. Three, we never started dialysis, as I mentioned. We still have three patients as from today, and this has changed by this afternoon, that are now on dialysis, um, and we've had only one recovery. Um, on our chronic uh, patients, however, have had a really much brighter look, uh, outlook compared to what we expected. We've had 13 positive patients, um, we've been dialysing many of them in hospital due to their lack of ability to be able to travel to the centre safely. We have three PD patients that are dialysing and self-isolating at home. We've had two, only two deaths, which I think is quite remarkable. One had an extremely large heart and, and probably a, a poor ejection fraction. And the other one was too frightened to come to the unit when she had symptoms skipped a dialysis session and unfortunately was very fluid overloaded at the time of presentation. But really we've had 10 recoveries and I think that's quite phenomenal. We've had seven transplant patients that have been infected. We pulled out of one just recently because they had a very uh, poor, a poor outlook. Um, we've had to admit two of them, but they're currently doing okay. And the rest have actually recovered or are recovering. And I just want to say that we're probably underestimating our referrals as decisions have been made by, more, by some of our other, other colleagues to say the prognosis has been too poor 
and we actually haven't been involved from the outset. So what do our acute patients who dialyze look like? Um, they're, 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 these are particularly the ones in the ICU. They're male, they're hypertensive, they're obese, they have HIV, um, CKD and diabetes. There are actually no surprises there, given all the data that we understand already. And um, my final slide, which I will give you some take home messages, is that we're still learning about infectivity of SARS CoV 2 in the kidney. Acute kidney, kidney injury is an independent risk factor for mortality. Once requiring ICU and renal replacement therapy, our outcomes are pretty dismal, actually. Our chronic kidney patients who get infected are actually in our setting have been doing quite well, surprisingly, but it's probably because of the younger age group. And our transplant patients are at very high risk of getting infected. They also have a high risk of acute kidney injury and are also at an increased risk of mortality. So I just want to thank you and I want to thank a few people who helped me um, troll through the endless amount of data that's out there today and assisted me with slides and some information. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nikki. That was a really excellent overview of, of, of this topic. Um, before we move on to the panel discussion, I wondered if I could ask, uh, ask you one uh, question. Um, and that is, um, you've obviously had to deal with a very challenging situation uh, in the renal dialysis unit on many occasions now with uh, patients uh, bring, with symptoms arriving at the unit or being diagnosed with the, uh, COVID having been in the unit. Um, and uh, I want to give you credit for the speed at which you've responded uh, to these situations and the meticulous way that you've gone around uh, dealing with those potential outbreaks. And I think that has really reflected in, in the, the low numbers of cases that you've had relative to some other places. If, if you could just expand on the way that you have approached um, the situation where there has been a contact within the unit and, and to try and reduce the risks of, of an outbreak. I, I think it would be useful information for people. Okay, so there's a couple of things. Um, there, there's probably three main things that I can think of that we've identified. The first is that those patients, there's many patients who use HealthNet who are coming, they were traveling together. And we did, our, and also sharing um, cars, we did identify that they weren't wearing masks initially in the car. So that was the first thing. The second thing is we realized that there's sneaky little tea rooms that people go and, uh, um, go and have cups of tea, and uh, we've actually put a stop to all of those or limited the numbers. Um, I've been meticulous in not allowing anybody with symptoms into the unit. So unfortunately, that's quite difficult on somebody who actually needs to, uh, to have dialysis, but what I've decided to do um, is, has been to send patients down for testing, um, give them Kexalate and Manitol until their tests become available, I've had very close relationships with the virologist to try to speed our test results up because we know how important it is. And I think I've really involved, I've had a lot of help, and you included, Graham, of trying to troubleshoot how we manage these case, cases. And I've also had a lot of conversations with them independently, individually, and a lot of discussions within the unit to try and maintain safety. Thanks, thanks, Nikki. So we're going to move on to the, the panel discussion now, and I'd, I'd like to um, introduce the, the three panelists. Uh, the first is Craig Arendt, so well known to us at, at UCT and Critiska. Craig is a nephrologist in private at, at Melamed Gatesville Private Hospital in Cape Town. And then uh, Zenaid Bardet, uh, consultant nephrologist in the Division of Nephrology at Critiska and UCT. And the third panelist is Ivan Jaber, who's uh, head of the ICU and a critical care specialist. Uh, at Kritiski and UCT. So I, I want to open it up to the panel now and, and firstly, Craig, um, if you've got any comments or, or questions that you would like to address to Nikki, welcome. Thank you everyone and hello uh, to everyone out there. Uh, well done Nikki, that was an excellent uh, summation of what we've had to get to know and get to understand in a very short period of time. Certainly, if I can just make one or two comments, uh, you know, being um, in the private practice almost exclusively now, we've had, uh, you know, quite a run in of, of new discovery of, of positive patients in our units. And I think in particular, our private unit in Mitchell's Plain 
and in the Athlone Gateshall area, we've we've seen a a very sharp rise in identification of cases within the last three and four weeks. Uh, initially, when our outbreak started, we we discovered cases very coincidentally, uh, especially from patients having having recently left the hospital or having recently had hospitalized based procedures and then presenting later on in their uh, you know post uh, discharge with with a positive um, mild usually mild symptoms and then positive uh, testing and that's really led to us having to having to almost be forced to do almost global testing on on most of the patients in the unit obviously every time or both times that, uh, and I think that's the case for all the units in, in the private units, every time a case is found, there's this real sort of panic uh, going on and uh, sort of uh, in, 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 in both the minds of the patients as well as the staff because it really creates quite a, a sense of havoc and quite a sense of almost uh, a, a panic within the unit. So we've done a few rounds of global, global unit testing where we've tested everyone um, across the board and uh, in our first round, for instance, at Mitchell's Plain, we tested about 100 patients and found very incidentally, you know, about 10 of those patients being positive. So most of our cases are represented by, by patients who have very mild symptoms and in fact, you know, most of those patients have bypassed the, the screening tool in, in such a way that they've, you know, either downplayed their symptoms substantially and have almost, uh, in retrospect, you know, if you if you interview them, they found they they report that you know they didn't really think much of the slight little cough or didn't think much of the of the one day of temperature that that they had enough to have mentioned it uh, to the screening uh, nurse or or individual, and most of them have been fine. Um, in just last week, we discovered uh, two cases within our Gatesville unit, which is about a 70 patient unit. And within a week of global testing, we discovered a further 16 patients. And, um, and once again, the same story is, is prevalent in most of those incidences where they have very minimal to mild symptoms and really don't report this on screening tools. So our screening tool, we've, also, we've almost uh, lost a little bit of faith in the screening tool. Uh, particularly the temperatures, most of them be present a, in an apyrexial fashion. And um, a lot of the other symptoms, the sort of body pains and the slight little cough, and in fact, the, the lack of or the loss of smell and taste has become a lot more prominent than if you, uh, and once again, you know, reported in a retrospective uh, sort of fashion. Um, we've had in that group, we've had uh, two very unfortunate um, deaths. Um, one case in particular was a very um, a lot, very tall, very big black uh, India, black man, black African man, about a, uh, 1.8 meters tall and about 110 kilograms. And he, you know, was found uh, dialyzed on our so-called red dialysis shift. And despite being completely well, he was found to have a, a sets on, 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 on the dialysis session of about 60%. And we rushed, rushed him into hospital uh, found really horrific uh, looking chest x-rays and three days later ended up on a ventilator and died on the fourth day. And that was really a, a very sort of eye-opening uh, case for myself and our group here as to the se severe, rapidly progressive, you know, rapidly deteriorating um, case, which, uh, of which we've seen quite a few of in our, in our, in our sort of other non-CKD, non-kidney failure patients, but you know, he was the first case in our in our acute group, you know, in our chronic uh, dialysis, kidney dialysis patient group, and then also another case where you know a patient died of of a sudden cardiac death within the unit uh, and arrived at the hospital too late. But yeah, that that the uh, the point that I think was was was, was of biggest uh, concern for us was how many patients were bypassing our screening tools and basically. Contam effectively contaminating our units um, uh, to the point where we've had to really scramble to to get them tested and get them out into you know PPE sort of dedicated uh, red shifts or red units and and PUI units, which has been the order of the day basically since since the beginning of uh, so the last month or so. 
Zenaida, I don't know what you guys have been doing on that front. Thanks very much for sharing those experiences, uh, Craig. I'll, I'm going to hand over to Zenaid now, but I just wanted to say before handing over to Zenaid that the chat function is open. So if people want to type questions once we've been around the panel, uh, then Mark can, can relay those questions. So Zenaid, uh, your experiences, particularly uh, picking up on, on some of Craig's issues? Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Nikki. It was a great talk. Look, I mean, Nikki and Craig have covered a lot of the issues. Um, just, you know, there's a, we've got a small dialysis unit at UCD private hospital. And I mean, just to emphasize what, what Craig has said, it, it spreads very quickly. We had one shift, uh, it's a six, only a six bed unit and there were five patients on that shift and they all got it. So it, it's just very infectious. And I mean, we all, they all had the screening tool and they all had temperature checks and, you know, everybody, everybody still got it. So, um, because of that, uh, you know, uh, th th those patients, well, in fact, the unit was closed down and, and uh, uh, fortunately there was another unit about to open where, where they've had to move to. Um, on, on the transplant side, I mean, you know, Nick, Nikki, Nikki briefly touched on that. Uh, there, there isn't a lot of good data to, to tell you, you know, what the right and the wrong thing to do. I think people have, have followed what the guidelines have been for any other patient that's been severely ill with an infection from, from the past, which means we, we always stop the anti-metabolite because, I mean, as you know, a lot of these patients uh, present with low lymphocyte counts in particular, and those drugs are particularly, I mean, they target the lymphocytes. So we always stop the uh, sulfate or MMF and then also the azathioprine, depending on what they're on. Um, you know, as soon as the patient has, has picked up, um, you know, we've got evidence that they might have, have COVID-19. Um, and then if they're more sick, then, I mean, you, you might even stop all immunosuppression, maybe besides for the steroids, but that we normally reserve for patients that are, you know, maybe going on to a ventilator uh, or, you know, certainly look like they, 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 they're worsening just despite stopping just the anti-metabolites. Uh, but this is what we would have done anyway in, 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 in you know, uh, before COVID-19 came on the scene in a severely septic patient. Um, and then and, uh, it's it just the, the story about the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, uh, you know, I mean, it, it makes, well, the data seems that, uh, to recommend not stopping it, but obviously anybody that's becoming hypertensive and the, the renal function is going off, I mean, it, it wouldn't seem wise to continue that. I mean, a lot of these patients end up on inotropes, et cetera. So, uh, and, and some of those, uh, depending on which, which, uh, which drug it is, you know, the half-life might be fairly long. So. I, I probably would have a lower threshold for stopping those drugs, especially if the patient's you know, blood pressure is dropping. Um, uh, yeah, um, otherwise, I don't think I've got too much more to, more to add. I mean, ex except to say our patients have done relatively well, I think because we, we're dealing with a younger population compared to you know, Europe and America, where uh, the average age of even their transplant patients is a lot higher than ours. So they're reporting 25% mortality rates on average uh, hopefully we, we won't get to those numbers and we haven't so far in our, you know, um, five or 10 patients that have, that, that we've had to deal with. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Anad. Um, over to Ivan. Uh, Ivan, do you want to come in comments from your experience in ICU and any questions that you have for Nikki? Yeah. Um, just thanks very much for inviting me uh, this afternoon. Um, I think, I think probably the thing we need to tackle from a, a critical care perspective, and, and it's in a way the elephant in the room, and, and Nikki's shown you some of our data, uh, and that's the issue of, is there really any value um, in providing renal support to patients who are intubated and ventilated in an ICU environment? Um, and I think, I think I'd, I, from that perspective, I don't want to talk about the chronic uh, patients because I think Nikki's shown us quite good data that they do well. Um, but the reality is uh, a ventilated COVID patients who require dialysis are, are, are miserable. Um, and so in terms of the, the, the issue I'd like us to kind of have some discussion around is, should we be doing this or shouldn't we? And, and if we're going to continue, how long are we going to continue before we decide that it may be fruitless. Um, I guess, can I respond to that? Um, Ivan, I know you and I have talked about this <laughs> before. I actually think we need to be a little bit clearer about, we know that the outcomes are, are really not great. We're beginning to see the profile of patients that we know are not doing well. And I think we need a round table with, the, with all of us to actually decide um, who we're going to give a chance to. 
because as you and I both know, there's been multiple times where we haven't had a machine available, or we're switching people around, or we're trying to make those decisions. And um, I think we wanted to see how it would pan out, and maybe we need to do that for another week or so. But I, I think it is worth a worthwhile discussion, um, given the the very poor prognosis in these patients once they reach that point in time. And I'm talking. I'm talking the very unwell patients who are on inotropes in the ICU who are requiring renal replacement therapy. And um, yeah, I think we should have a round table about uh, who, who perhaps, I'm not going to say a blanket no, but I think we know that there are certain subgroup of patients that are particularly doing badly. So, so, so I think Nikki and I mean, I stand corrected and you've got the data perhaps on, on, on the dialyzed patients a little more precisely than I do, but of the patients we've dialyzed in, in ICU, and that includes CVVHD and SLED, et cetera, um, to date we have no, no discharge survivors at all. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there's one patient in ICU at the moment who has received dialysis, no longer on dialysis, but is still on a ventilator and still a long way from home. Yeah, that is correct. That is the correct data. We haven't had a success, sadly. We thought that we were looking that way, but unfortunately, um, yeah, we haven't had one yet. And that's despite our best attempts at trying to, to manage them. Can, can I comment on that? Yeah, sure, Craig, come in. Ivan, so, you know, my, my criticism about, about it is that you know, although I agree that renal failure may be, may be giving us a very uh, important clue as to, um, you know, how severe the disease is in that particular individual, as uh, Nikki commented in her presentation, you know, there are so many uh, unknown factors that um, contribute to the worsening uh, outcomes, you know, from as, from as, uh, uh, you know, from as uh, little as just volume correction of the patient's uh, volume and blood pressures to addressing the issue of, you know, is this a hypercoagulable state with a uh, type of microangiopathy that is involved? Um, I don't think we just know just enough about the pathophysiology, the, the, the real pathophysiology of this condition to, to write off too many patients without really giving them a chance. I do agree, though, we've seen a, lo a large mortality, but interestingly, just in the last week or two, I would say, we've tried, we've started using a lot more um, aggressive uh, strategies on anticoagulation. And, yeah. you know, we will definitely wait and see what the outcomes show, but, uh, you know, just from the four or five that we've used an aggressive approach on in this past week, we are seeing just a little bit of a turnaround in our prognosis now, and Patients who we previously would have said, um, you know, uh, may have done very poorly, or, you know, one or two of them are doing much better on an aggressive hyper, hyper uh, anticoagulation therapy. So I think the jury is still out somewhat on, on exactly what we're dealing with. What is the mechanism of disease? What is the pathophysiology that we have to address? And what particular uh, uh, therapy we have to throw at these uh, severe patients in order to, you know, get them out of this um, multi-organ failure scenario? Ivan, any thoughts? Yeah. So, so I think it's a, it's an incredibly complex situation. Um, I think Nikki's pointed out, and I agree with her. I think there there is direct renal involvement. Um, from SARS-CoV-2. So, so, so it's a disease that affects the kidney directly. But then too, we know well from data in terms of managing patients who have ARDS, that injurious ventilation can induce renal failure and acute kidney injury and, and in its own right. And, and obviously a number of these patients are in that situation. And although we talk about lung protective ventilation, lung protective ventilation is there to lessen the injury that the lung experiences. It can't, it can't eliminate it. And ventilator-induced lung injury then sets up an inflammatory milieu, which obviously affects the entire microcirculation and the kidneys fall, fall victim to that. So, so there may be more than one thing going on 
um, from a renal perspective. Plus, I agree with you, there, there seems to be a, an issue of hypercoagulability, and we, we certainly anticoagulating our patients um, very, very aggressively. And, the, and then I think, just if I, if I think of the data in terms of ARDS, the older ARDS studies, in many of those studies, the combination of respiratory failure from ARDS and renal failure requiring dialysis was already or has been associated with a mortality of in excess than 60%. And when you look at combinations of organ failure in ICU, the combination of renal and respiratory failure is a particularly ominous one. And unfortunately, that's exactly the, uh, the situation we're talking about for these patients. So, so, so it's complicated. And, and Craig, I don't want to throw, throw in the towel by any means. Um, because clearly, we're all trying very, very hard. And we want to, you know, try and give as many patients as we possibly can the best we can. Um, and when I said kind of the elephant in the room is, is, is at what point in time do we kind of say, okay, we're not winning anymore? Because yeah. in, in the I've had with Nikki, um, as I say, at the moment, we just got no one who's been discharged alive. And, and they are, they, there is a patient in ICU who's come off dialysis and may be discharged alive. I would certainly hope so. But the, the mortality rate for patients with acute kidney injury and respiratory failure from COVID and ICU is enormously high. It's a reality, um, and, and we can't ignore that. Yeah, I think, can I just, sorry, sorry, Graham, yeah. you go. No, you go for it, Nikki, and then I'll come in with a... a just a, a very break. quick thing. I, I think the thing is that we've got only a certain number of machines, um, and, um, and there have been very challenging days when we've tried to shuffle everybody around, and, and we really have tried, and I, I don't think we should stop doing so, but it's, uh, if the numbers are going to get worse which i suspect they are we may just need to be a little bit more thoughtful because once they get on a renal replacement they don't come off quickly they're not on for a day they're on for a, a reasonable length of time and we might just need to be thoughtful in the in the peak of this pandemic about how we're actually going to manage these patients um there and i, I agree with craig i don't i don't want to give up on them but i we might need to just be a bit thoughtful as we're going to have our limited resources uh, really totally maximised. Nikki, I just wanted to make a point that's uh, not directly addressing this the, this last round of discussion, but is related, and that is, the, the, I was very glad that you presented that slide showing the kind of peaks of uh, renal impairment. You know, patients can present with it and then develop it late during admission. And we've seen a number of patients being admitted to our COVID wards, not to the ICU, to the COVID wards with COVID pneumonia. We've had a creatinine of around 200 to 250 uh, that has, has rapidly reversed on, on intravenous rehydration. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I just wanted to make a point that we, I don't think we should take the admission renal injury or acute kidney injury uh, as a as a poor prognostic sign, uh, I think it's it's a very different scenario when it occurs and it's progressive in ICU compared to the initial uh, injury and the patient is not yet on a ventilator. And as I say, we've had a number of those people reverse. So, just a a, a, a point to, to distinguish between the, the 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 two kind of timings of the renal impairment. The first, I think, can be reversible in some people. The second appears to the later renal impairment seems to be a very ominous poor prognostic feature in ICU. Yeah. Um, just, uh, I, I think Mark, um, Mark has, has three questions from the chat room for Nikki, if you want to, if you want to take those, Mark. Great, thank you. Uh, if there's noise in the background, for those who are not in Cape Town, it's the rain coming down on the roof. Our, our apologies. Uh, we're always happy when it rains here. Graham, uh, there's one specific renal question. It's around uh, uh, tenophobia as part of ART. Question is to the nephrologist: Do they think it's playing a role in HIV-positive patients um, who have got COVID and renal injury? I'm just going to finish them all, uh, and then there's some generalist questions. Uh, the one is again to maybe to Ivan. Uh, many patients with CKD uh, who have uh, anemia, low HB, does that influence sets, finger prick sets? Uh, sorry, finger sets readings at all? Uh, then. Uh, we have one comment from a colleague who's outside of Cape Town asking about, and Ivan, maybe to yourself, the use of uh, CVPs 
uh, being inserted uh, in terms of fluid management and patients with renal impairment. She, a uh, colleague, works in a hospital where this is uh, often used and uh, wants some guidance on the value of CVPs. Uh, Graham, there is a question generally about anticoagulation, and I'm wondering if we shouldn't leave that for a dedicated session on anticoagulation yeah. because it's a question that comes up every week. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think the tension off of your question, I must be honest with you, it's not something that we're, I, I'm not saying it's not out there, but it's not something that we're seeing that has increased. That's been, that's been a notable increase, and I, I would, uh, as a, if we're not actually seeing that that's a major problem, that's any worse than a normal problem or an, a normal week. So I don't think tenofovir is really uh, adding to the problem at the moment. So that that's my part. I think the others are for you, Ivan. The SATs in the CKD. So. so the first one, the saturation, is a very easy question to, to answer, and that is, given the levels of anemia that are compatible with life, uh, there will be really no impact on saturation reading at all. So, so you don't need to worry about a patient with a low hemoglobin and the interpretation of their saturation. Uh, it's important. Um, the second issue was with respect to using CVPs to optimize um, intravascular fluid status. Um, something which has been the subject of huge, huge, huge studies in the literature. And, and, and just to say to all of you, there is absolutely no evidence in the literature to say that a CVP can in any way help you optimize a patient's circulating volume. Um, I, when I started critical care, taught many registrars and MOs to do fluid challenges and, and assess the response of the CVP to a fluid challenge. Um, we've given it up for probably the last 15 years or so in ICU, and the, the evidence very, very clearly shows that that does not work. And I, I would just like to emphasize that. We, we put central lines into patients in ICU as a matter of routine for, for intravascular access and fluid administration. Um, in ordinary ICU patients, we do not measure CVP as a matter of routine at all. I've been seeing we're discussing fluid status. I'm just interested in your thoughts as to whether uh, intravascular fluid status has any impact on um, the the lung function and and uh, in in patients with COVID. Yeah. So, so I think Graham, just first of all, just to to reinforce what you said, I think there are many COVID patients who come in and are quite behind on fluid with high creatinines, and and good fluid resuscitation of those patients is important. And they're not the same as the patients with, with late-stage AKI that we're seeing in, in, in ICU. So, so, so that, I, that I do think um, I agree with you very, very strongly. And then we know that all of us have a, a degree of leak in our pulmonary capillary bed all of the time. And that, that fluid is removed by lymphatics into the, into the central circulation. And when we develop a respiratory disease, the leakiness of that becomes greater. And it, it means that we can put anyone to pulmonary edema, it doesn't matter how good their heart or their kidneys are, if we try hard enough. And patients with respiratory disease are closer to that threshold of developing a, a kind of pulmonary edema fluid overload. So, so we have to accept that when we're trying to fluid optimize patients with, with COVID pneumonia, they are all going to be sitting closer to the precipice of developing pulmonary edema than a normal healthy individual would be. I think the big difficulty from a clinical perspective is we don't know just how close they all are. But if we continue to give them fluid um, on an ongoing basis, then we will add respiratory morbidity from our fluid therapy. So it's a, it's a very complex thing to try and deal with. Great, thanks. That's a really useful point, Ivan. Um, so I think uh, we've just come to the top of the hour. Um, uh, just to say thank you to um, Hannah, firstly, uh, for a, a, a great overview of the epidemic and where we are at, to Nikki for a, an excellent overview of this of this important topic in COVID, and to the uh,
three panel members, Craig, Zunaid, and Ivan. Uh, I think it's been a really engaging conversation. A lot of really important points raised in, in the discussion uh, from, from a, a range of, of different experiences of, of COVID. Craig, uh, from, from your private sector setting, Zunaid from, from the renal unit at, at Kritzke and Ivan from the ICU. I think it's been a, a varied conversation with a, a lot of really important points raised. Uh, so thanks to everyone, another great uh, webinar and we'll be back next week. Thanks, back to you, uh, Mark and Wendy. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. And in, and in parting, we just want to, I'd like to give a shout out to Professor Stuart Saunders. I see he's on the webinar, uh, past Vice Chancellor, past Head of Department of Medicine. Prof, we hope you're well and staying safe. <laughs>